Hey guys, it's Dr. Price with Action Potential Mentoring, and we're going to cover the highest yield surgery questions for your USMLE Step 2 CK and your shelf exam. You can follow me on Twitter at action underscore AP if you want some quick hitting facts, some study techniques, some tactics every day. Feel free to follow us there. Here's our other social media connections. The links will be in the description. All right, so without further ado, let's get rolling. Number one, patient comes in, they got blood two hours ago. Now they have fever, chills. What do you think is happening? This is usually an acute febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. And so these are going to get better all on their own. They're going to give the patient Tylenol, boom, no other problems. And this is often due to the cytokines in the transfused blood itself. And so to prevent this, just give the patient leuka depleted red blood cells next time. So this is not life or death. This is not something critical that can harm the patient irreparably, but you can give them leuka depleted red blood cells to prevent this. Happening. Let's see right here. What about if the patient got some blood products? Now they have hemoglobinuria and flank pain. Well, the hemoglobinuria means that you're basically peeing out blood. You're lysing it. This is going to be a hemolytic transfusion reaction from an ABO incompatibility. This is a never event in the hospital. This means that there's a clerical error, meaning that whenever they read the blood types, they did not match and they still gave the blood. Or maybe the bag of blood was mislabeled by accident. So this is a never event. All right, look for the hemoglobinuria and that will clue you in. Next, patient that got blood about six hours ago and now they have shortness of breath, crackles in their lungs and edema. Take a look at their neck. They have elevated JVP. What the heck is going on? So you want to get a chest x-ray to see are they fluid overload? And chances are this is TACO, transfusion associated circulatory overload. This is basically just fluid overload from blood products. That's all it is. And so you want to give these patients diuretics, tell them to sit upright so they can breathe better. And then you can give them oxygen via nasal cannula. And that generally will get these patients through this. All right, number two, moving on from the blood transfusions to a bleeding question. Patient has an upper GI bleed after necrotizing pancreatitis. They have varices on endoscopy. What do you think was the cause of all this? Well, it's probably splenic vein thrombosis. And so think about the anatomy of where the splenic vein is. I have a picture here of your pancreas. You can see where the splenic vein is at. It's right at the top and behind the pancreas itself. And so severe necrotizing pancreatitis can cause cytokine release and inflammation into that splenic vein. And so this can cause thrombosis from all the inflammation. And you can eventually get bleeding because of backup of the blood, increased pressure, and you can have variceal bleeding. So if you see varices, don't just jump immediately onto cirrhosis. A lot of people do this, and this is not the way to get these questions. So see the entire question stem. If the patient's got a history of severe alcoholism, maybe it is cirrhosis. They have severe hepatitis, probably is cirrhosis. But if the patient has necrotizing pancreatitis plus varices, you want to start thinking of splenic vein thrombosis. All right, but what about hepatic vein thrombosis? This is also known as Bud Chiari syndrome. And so these patients generally will have jaundice as well. So they'll have hepatomegaly, portal hypertension. They'll have jaundice, which the splenic vein thrombosis will not have. So if you know your anatomy, these questions are pretty easy. But if you are a little bit shaky on your step one anatomy, think of what kind of clues can clue you in. So if you see pancreatitis plus varices, you're thinking splenic vein thrombosis. If you see jaundice plus thrombosis of a vein and you don't know where it is, it's probably going to be the hepatic vein, aka Bud Chiari. So moving on, number three, patient comes in, they're in a seat collar, they're unstable, they have a cervical and thoracic spinal injury by your exam, you feel a step off in the back, and meaning that when you're feeling the vertebrae in the back, there's a huge drop off at one of them. So you're thinking that there's some kind of an injury there. So if this patient is in shock, they're going to have bradycardia. And this bradycardia is due to the decreased sympathetic tone. This is extremely important because whenever you see shock, generally the patients will be tachycardic. But if it is a neurogenic type of shock, you will see bradycardia. So always keep that on your differential with a low blood pressure plus bradycardia. Because remember, your heart's going to try and keep a consistent cardiac output. But if there's no sympathetic tone, it's not going to be able to raise the heart rate to compensate for the decreased blood pressure. Okay? So number four, patient has a history that sounds like, let's say, prostate cancer, and now they have low back pain and new neurologic symptoms. You want to get an emergent MRI to evaluate from metastasis of the prostate cancer to your spine and new resultant cauda equina syndrome. So cauda equina is basically bilateral lower extremity weakness. You can oftentimes lose deep tendon reflexes, 
bowel function, bladder function, might even say that there is poor rectal tone, and these patients are going to have saddle anesthesia. So if you suspect that there is metastasis to the spine with new onset neurologic symptoms, the neurosymptoms mandate an MRI immediately. Number five, patient gets hit in the head. They're in football practice, or maybe they were mugged, and now they have clear fluid draining out of their ears, draining out of their nose. What is that? That's a basilar skull fracture. The fluid that drains out is going to be CSF. You can monitor it by seeing that it's high in chloride. I got that TQ from Golion back in the day. And so you can get the CSF draining through your nose via the cribriform plate fractures. All right, so here's kind of a good picture that I liked. You see basilar skull fracture. It can be through, let's say, the cribriform plate, the temporal bone, etc. You're going to see the raccoon eyes. These patients are going to have blood behind their eardrum, so hemotympanum. And they'll often have the battle sign, which is post-auricular ecchymosis. You really, really want to know these things to clue you into basilar skull fracture. They're almost always going to have a very prominent history in these question stems, such as getting hit in the head with a baseball bat or something like that. But you need to know the things that can be associated with the basilar skull fractures for those next step of association type questions. All right. Number six, patient has basal cell carcinoma. They get an excision. Let's say that they have it right here on their cheek or on their ear. They excise it and it looks good. It's completely healing up a couple months later. But the doctor gets in contact with the patient and says, hey, listen, there is path on the little excision that we did that shows that the tumor goes clear out to the margins. What should you do? Well, because the tumor was shown to be at the margins of the pathology sample, you have to do a re-excision. Students miss this question all the time because they're like, oh, I would just watch it, wait, see if it recurs. The, the wound is healing fine. I don't see any more basal cell carcinoma, but that's wrong. You want to do a re-excision of the excision site, even if the incision appears well healed. And it's because you might have missed some of those cells because if the pathology shows the tumor went clear out to the margins, you didn't get it all. So you have to go back in and re-excise whatever you just excised. All right. Sounds counterintuitive, but I've seen it tested on the NBME. That's why I'm sharing it. Number seven, patient comes in, they have tons of burns, especially if it's like 20, 30% of their body surface area. What's your next step of management? It's always going to be to replace fluids immediately. And they'll give you other answer choices that are very tempting, such as give them nasal cannula or escherotomy so they don't get compartment syndrome. You want to replace fluids ASAP. As long as they're stable, then give them the fluids. All right, so here's Parkland formula. This is going to be the formula you actually use in real life to calculate fluid replacements in patients with burns. So you take the four milliliters, multiply that by the body surface area percentage. So let's say 20%, and then multiply that by their weight in kilograms. And that's going to get you 50% of that is given in the first eight hours. And then 50% is given in the result in 16 hours. So basically they're going to get all that volume within 24 hours, but you front load 50% of it into the first eight hours. All right, number eight. This is something that can trick you. Patient has a benign sounding injury. Let's say they scraped their knee, they hit their elbow. They did something that sounded kind of like what happens on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And the patient usually will be a diabetic. But now you see that the patient has severe fever, crepitus at the wound. It can eat gas in the tissues. You want to be thinking necrotizing fasciitis. Any time on the boards you see gas in tissues, as well as in real life, this is really bad. And so this is going to be something like gas gangrene, necrotizing fasciitis. So the treatment is going to be immediate broad spectrum antibiotics because basically their fascial planes and their muscles is just disintegrating and the gas is just infiltrating up into their tissues. So you want to put them on vancomycin and piperacillin plus tazobactam and clindamycin. The clindamycin helps with the toxin production from necrotizing fasciitis. Give these patients fluids, get them stable, put them on pressors such as norepinephrine, and then take them to surgery to excise and debride the wound. They will never get better with just antibiotics from my experience. You have to take them to the operating room and cut out whatever the necrotizing fasciitis is. Okay, so if they have a leg wound, got to cut out all that tissue. I'm talking like huge amounts of cubic centimeters of tissue. All right, here's a trick question with necrotizing fasciitis that I've seen a couple students miss before. They see all these gas bubbles in the x-ray and it says, what's the next step? And they'll have MRI as an answer choice to get a better qualification of the, of the actual extent of uh, necrotizing fasciitis. This is wrong. This is too slow, first off. But second off, necrotizing fasciitis is a clinical diagnosis. 
but gas in the x-ray can help you clue it in, but this is not required to actually diagnose it. So you definitely don't need an MRI. These patients go emergently to the operating room, put them on antibiotics and ship them down to the OR as fast as possible. In real life, I've actually had to do these massive necrotizing fasciitis debridements at bedside because the patient was too unstable to even go to the operating room. So that's how severe this is. Number nine, patient comes in, they have a mid shaft humeral fracture. Now they can't extend their wrist. What nerve is it? That's your radial nerve injury at the mid shaft of the humerus. So remember your nerves of your humerus are ARM. So A for axillary, R for radial, and then M for median. So it literally goes down your arm, the mnemonic is arm, A-R-M. All right, number 10, patient comes in, they're post-op, let's say six hours from a big surgery that had an x lap in their abdomen. They're now hypertensive, tachycardic, and in such severe pain that they can't really move. What's your next step in management? Look for the answer choice that says increase the dosage of pain medicine because the sympathetic tone is going to cause all their vitals to shoot upwards. So they're in a ton of pain, they're grimacing, they're squeezing down. You want to give them more pain medicine so they're more comfortable. That'll fix the hypertension and tachycardia. Number 11, let's say a patient has a central line or they have a PIC line and now they have a fever, bacteremia, and an erythematous indurated vein and there's pus actually draining out of the catheter. What is this? Well, it's going to be catheter-associated septic thrombophlebitis. And so the treatment is going to be broad-spectrum antibiotics and then excise the vein itself to get rid of the nidus of infection. If there's pus literally draining from a central line or some sort of catheter, that's pretty bad. That's like a huge, huge deal in the hospital because central line infections can be devastating because it goes directly into your central venous system. So remember, if you just see regular old superficial thrombophlebitis, you would never do all that stuff. This is if you just have septic thrombophlebitis with like pus draining out of it. If it's just a regular thrombophlebitis, you elevate their arm, elevate their leg, put on a warm and cool compress, give them some NSAIDs, some Tylenol kind of stuff, and they get better pretty quickly. So totally different pictures, even though they both have the word thrombophlebitis in it. Look to see the one that's septic or just superficial. All right, number 12. Something I want you to know for your exam is pulmonary emboli can present with lungs that are clear to auscultation. They might not have any murmurs or gallops or tenderness or edema of their lower extremities. That is okay. It can still be a pulmonary embolism on your NBMEs or your USMLE. And so do not let all the negatives throw you off if you are super convinced that the patient has a PE. So maybe they have a history of pancreatic cancer. All the cytokines make them hypercoagulable. Maybe they're dipstick and tachypnic. All right, maybe they're tachycardic. Maybe they're immediately post-op, so they've been immobilized. All these things can clue you into a PE, but don't let the negative findings of clear lungs no tenderness in the lower extremities. Don't let that throw you off. Number 13, this is a huge question here that I can foresee being tested on the USMLE. I've seen it on prior NBMEs, and I know this is going to show up at some time or another because it makes a lot of sense mechanistically. So a patient has a liver transplant two or three months ago. They now come back to clinic on their follow-up. They're short of breath. They have a fever, and there's dullness to percussion of the chest. What is this? Well, you want to be thinking of empyema. These patients are going to be on tacrolimus or serolimus or other really, really strong immunosuppressants. And oftentimes with liver transplants, you're going to have recurrent pleural effusions just due to the inflammation around the right side of the hemidiaphragm above the liver. And so the immunocompromised state because of the medications plus bacteria getting into those recurrent pleural effusions, and you got yourself an empyema. And so these are pretty severe. I have two pictures to show you, but the treatment is going to be a chest tube and IV antibiotics. So here you can see, this is an empyema. It's a ton of fluid and infection in this lung field in the right lung. And then look down here on the chest x-ray. You can see how this side is all whited out. Looks really bad. There's a huge amount of pleural effusion. You can't see the costophrenic angles very well. This is going to be an empyema. You need to put in a chest tube, also known as a tube thoracostomy, and then IV antibiotics. So don't get fooled on your MBMEs whenever you don't see the word chest tube. Chest tube could also be listed as tube thoracostomy. All right, number 14, patient has a motor vehicle crash. 24 hours later, they now have crackles, a cough, and of note, their afebrile. Their temperature is 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So what is this? Well, this is a lung contusion until proven otherwise. Here's a chest x-ray of exactly what it looks like. 
it's an irregular kind of looking bruise on the chest x-ray of the lung. And so this is not going to be lobular like a pneumonia. It's not going to be in a specific lobe of the lung. It's not going to usually be at the costophrenic angle like a pleural effusion. It's not going to be like perihilar lymphadenopathy like you'd see with tuberculosis or sarcoidosis. It's basically just a bruise into the lung that is after a trauma. So here's some things that you really need to know. It's going to be within 24 hours after a blunt thoracic trauma. I saw one question where it presented 48 hours later, so keep that in mind. Patients are usually going to be a little bit hypoxic. Their oxygen saturations might be like 88%. They're going to be tach tachycardic, tachypnic. They might have some decreased breath sounds where that bruise and inflammation is at in the lung. And a CT scan is going to be the most sensitive test. So that's going to give you a much clearer picture than a chest x-ray because the chest x-ray kind of just looks like a patchy alveolar infiltrate. And it's not restricted by anatomic borders here. So what do you do for a pulmonary contusion? You want to give them some pain control. Do everything that we call pulmonary toilet, meaning pulmonary hygiene maneuvers, such as put them on duoneb nebulizers. Give them chest physiotherapy, where it basically vibrates the chest to help with the recruitment of alveoli and help them cough up any mucus that they have. And you want to give them supplemental oxygen and ventilation until they're through this. And generally, these are self-resolving at that point. All right, number 15, patient comes in after a motor vehicle crash. They have an obscured left hemidiaphragm and an NG tube that's in the lower left side of the chest. This is huge for your boards. You will see this on step two in your surgery shelf exam all the time. This is a diaphragmatic rupture. So you have to know your anatomy here because it's going to clue you in and make this a much easier concept. So imagine you're looking at the underside of the diaphragm here. This is the back left of the diaphragm. So it's the botch de lec. Kind of remember back left, botch de lec kind of sounds the same in my head. And so this is where the diaphragm will most commonly rupture and your intestinal contents can actually shoot upwards into your lung cavity through that hernia. And so if you know your anatomy, you know that on this chest x-ray, it's usually going to be on the left side. Almost every single TQ I've ever seen about ruptured diaphragm is on the left side. Remember, because that's botched elect back left. And so you see the NG tube right here. It's actually in the lung field. And so this is absolutely huge. You can even see the gastric bubble. You see where my mouse is outlining. You see the gastric bubble of where the NG tube is at. Your entire stomach is essentially up into the left lung here. So how would you differentiate a diaphragmatic rupture from an esophageal rupture? So esophageal ruptures, the patient's basically going to look like they're about to die, for lack of better words. They're going to have mediastinitis with crepitus over their chest, have a severe fever, they're going to have chest pain, and they're on their way to being extremely septic. So they could have decreasing blood pressure, increasing heart rate. All right, number 16. If you have an absolute neutrophil count over 250 in ascites on your paracentesis plus abdominal pain and fever, and it's usually in an alcoholic or somebody that just spontaneously got this, you're thinking spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Generally, they're going to have some form of liver failure that caused all of the ascites, and then the ascites itself gets seeded by bacteria and causes spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Like a normal person that has healthy liver function is generally not going to get this because you just don't have ascites for the bacteria to infiltrate. And so you diagnose SBP with paracentesis with an absolute neutrophil count over 250. Could even be in the thousands. And so the treatment is going to be a third gen cephalosporin followed by prophylaxis with Cipro or Bactrim. You really want to know this. The first line treatment is going to be a cephalosporin like ceftriaxone. And so step one reminder for you, how does this actually happen is all the portal hypertension causes the bowels to get edematous, and then the bacteria from the gut is going to translocate into that ascites fluid. All right. Number 17, patient has a positive ANCA and negative Saccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies. That's going to clue you into ulcerative colitis. What's the definitive diagnosis? Boom, colonoscopy. You have to know this. There's a couple layers of treatment that you want to make sure you know as well. Number one, if it just affects the rectum, give them a 5 aminosalicylic acid enema. So basically give them an aspirin type enema. What about if it's more extensive? You give them oral 5 ASA plus steroids. If that does not work, you can add in either azathioprine or infliximab, a monoclonal antibody. And if it's refractory to all that, or the patient progresses to toxic megacolon, you just do a total colectomy. You want to basically just cut out all that colon so that the patient doesn't rupture their colon and die. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. Here's a nice chart comparing Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. 
ulcerative colitis is going to have pseudo polyps. You absolutely want to know that. And it can progress to toxic megacolon. So it can be a surgical emergency. Crohn's disease on the other side is going to have non-caseate and granulomas, and it's going to be transmural inflammation on your colonoscopy. So you absolutely want to know the differences from Crohn's disease to ulcerative colitis. And then here's a nice review on toxic megacolon. So you see this in patients with C. diff classically or inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis. So these patients are going to be basically septic. So they're fe febrile, tachycardic, hypotensive. They're going to have bloody poop coming out and they're going to be extremely peritonitic. So you just touch their abdomen and they're jumping off the bed. It hurts them so bad. And so these patients get bowel rest, NG2 put into their nose to suction out their intestinal contents and antibiotics. If this does not work, these patients need to go to surgery. So toxic megacolon can be a surgical emergency and it can make the patient very, very sick and septic. All right, guys, that's everything. Those are some of the highest yield surgery questions for your USMLE Step 2 CK and your shelf exam. If you have any questions, drop them down in the comments below. Follow us on Twitter, action underscore AP. And as always, subscribe to the channel. I hope this was helpful.